Hey guys, Jay here with Word of Advice TV, and in this video we're going to be going over a little safety device that can cause a furnace to short cycle. This little device is called a limit switch, and it can go by many other names depending on what it's being used for, like a limit switch, a fan limit, upper limit, high limit switch, flame rollout switch, thermal device, etc, etc. But all of these limit switches in a furnace are essentially meant to do the same thing, which is to turn the furnace off if it is getting too hot. So in this video, we're going to be going over how it works, what it does, we're going to be testing it, we're going to be measuring it, and then in the end, we're also going to take them apart to see what they look like inside. This is going to be fun, at least for me, but I sincerely do hope you will enjoy the video as well. But before we go any further, I do want to point out, if you're watching this video because your furnace is not working and you simply just want to get the thing fixed, this is probably not the video for you. It's good information, but here I'm mainly going to be talking about how it works, not how to fix it. So after you're done with this video, I would recommend watching a few of my other videos, such as 10 reasons why a furnace overheats, furnace not blowing hot air and how to fix that, the most common furnace problem. And if all of that doesn't sound like something that you're experiencing, I also have a furnace playlist where I have many, many furnace videos and just browse through those videos and pick one of the video titles that sounds like the problem that you are experiencing. I do hope that you will find and fix the problem. I'm going to go ahead and put the playlist links and the video links in the description of this video. All right, let's get back to our high limit. So the high limit, this little metal part with the disc, that is going to be sitting inside of the furnace. If it's a little thing like this, then the metal part is going to be stuck inside of the furnace. You know, somewhere on the wall of the furnace, it'll be going inside where the heat exchanger is or above the heat exchanger. And then there's going to be two wires going into here, you know, to get the low voltage through. So this is a normally closed switch which means that electricity is usually flowing right through it. There's no problems if the furnace is working properly. So as the furnace is working, this little limit switch is in there and hot air is blowing right past it. So it's like constantly measuring the temperature of the air inside of the furnace. If it starts getting too hot, this normally closed little switch will open up and interrupt the power which will effectively turn off the gas burners or the heating element. And I know that this might be a little bit confusing because when we say the word switch, right away people are thinking of a light switch, not exactly something that looks like this or like this. But if we compare it to a light switch, so this is a normally closed switch. If we compare it to a light switch, which is essentially the same mechanism, a light switch that is normally closed would be the light switch that is on. So the lights are on and the power is flowing through it, no problems. That would be a normally closed switch if the lights are on. But if somebody comes up and flips that switch to the off position, that will open up that switch and interrupt the power from going through. The limit switch does the same thing, but it's automatic. So it's temperature based. If the temperature of the switch gets too hot, that's when that light switch would go in the off position. If this is still sounding confusing, don't worry about it. By the time this video is over, I'm sure you will understand it. So let's move on to the testing phase and let's go ahead and test this switch and see what it looks like on a meter. So I have three test subjects right here, three different limit switches. And I think we're going to go ahead and start with this one. This is a fairly common one in gas furnaces. And this one, all it is, is basically you got the two connections here and there's two metal prongs that go out all the way to the switch and connect to it right here. In fact, let's just, Let's cut one of them off. Let's cut one of these sleeves off so we can see what it looks like inside. It's literally just a piece of metal. There you go. That looks like that. So this part would be on the outside of the furnace and this part would be sticking in measuring the temperature of the air going past this little switch. So what I'm going to do is hook up my meter to it and set it to continuity to see if that switch is closed or not. If the switch is closed, which it should be because it's a normally closed switch, when it's set to continuity, we're gonna hear an audible beep. So it should start beeping. If you're not quite sure what a lot of these symbols mean, I do have a video where I talk about how to use a multimeter and I explain all of this. So if you're not too familiar with a multimeter, that video would be a really good video to watch. But anyway, I have it set to continuity. I already have my leads hooked up with little alligator clip attachments already on there. I'll put one side on one side, the other on the other. Voila, and we're hearing the beep. If we're hearing the beep, that means there is continuity 
that switch is closed. So let's actually unhook that. It's kind of annoying. So what I'm gonna do now is I'll put the two meter leads on. We're gonna hear the beep. I'm gonna put a lighter under this and I'm gonna roast this little switch until it trips or overheats. And one more thing I wanna point out is on the face of these switches, usually you're gonna see a number like this. See how it says L200 minus 40? That just means that this limit switch will trip once it gets to 200 degrees. And minus 40 means that it'll reset automatically once it gets down 40 degrees from 200. So it'll trip at 200 and it'll reset at 160. And I'll explain more of how it works on the inside when we take them apart. There's basically a little metal snap disc inside of here. Once it heats up, it warps and it kind of pops out, which triggers a little micro switch inside of here. And once again, once we take it apart, hopefully we'll be able to see that. So what I'm gonna do is I will roast this until it trips. That's when the beep should stop. And then hopefully I'll have enough time to use my little temp gun and see what temperature we're registering on this right here. It does cool off really fast, but hopefully I'll be able to catch it when it tripped and also we'll be able to tell when it resets automatically because the meter should start to beep again. And you can hear a little bit of a snap when it trips and when it resets. So when I start doing this, I'm gonna go ahead and take my microphone off and put it right next to it as well. And hopefully we're gonna hear the little snap disc snap. So there you go, let's give this a try. Okay, it snapped. No, okay. We're at 120. Dropping, 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 dropping. 102, 95. Okay, so unfortunately I can't catch the temperature with a temp gun because the air is blowing across it and it's just skewing the numbers. So according to this thing, it reset at 90 degrees, but I highly doubt that. Um, inside of there, it was probably hotter because this switch, it's not a faulty switch. So it basically tripped at 200 degrees, but it should reset at 160. So unfortunately we won't be able to monitor the temperature that way, but we do see how it works, how when I overheat this thing using a lighter, it trips and it opens that switch up. And then when it has time to cool off a little bit, it resets and we hear the beep on the meter again. Our next switch is exactly the same, except it doesn't have those two prongs on it. And the limit is 160 minus 40. So it should trip even faster. So once again, I'm gonna go ahead and hook up my leads, turn my meter on, and we're gonna roast this fella as well. until it trips and opens up the switch. And this is just an example to show you of how it opens up when there's an overheating situation. Oops, right there. And now we'll give it some time to cool off and we should hear a snap when it automatically resets. And there it goes. The snap disc snapped back into place and the switch is normally closed once again. The next switch we have is a flame rollout switch, which is also a limit switch, but unlike the other two, this is a manual reset. So if this one trips, it will not automatically reset. That's why there's a little button up on top of it. The flame rollout switch does not manually reset because oftentimes if this thing does trip, that means that the furnace heat exchanger is likely bad so they want you to check it out or a technician or somebody to look at the furnace before the switch is reset and the furnace continues to run. So it's the same limit switch, but it's manually resettable. So let's try that. I'll overheat this one 
and we should be able to see the button pop up a little bit. Let's let's try it. Bam, it tripped. And no matter how long I will wait, this one will not reset. But if I press the button in the middle, we should start to hear the beep right away. It's, it's resetting right away, even though I'm resetting it, because it's still too hot, it trips right away. So let's just wait for it to cool off a little bit so the snap disc goes back into its regular place. Okay, let's try that again. And I just realized that my microphone was away from that. So let's just do that one more time real quick with the mic right under it so we can try to hear the action. Okay, so it tripped. Now I'm just gonna wave it around to try to cool it off a little bit. Airflow, airflow guys. Okay. I'll try to just press the button and reset it. And you should be able to hear a click of that snap disc popping back out when I press this button. So here it goes. Voila, switch is reset and power can once again go through it. And this was just a simulation using a lighter, but I think you get the idea, the hot air going across the switch in a furnace if for some reason the furnace is getting too hot, that heat exchanger is getting too hot, which sometimes does happen, this switch would trip because it's getting too hot. But now let's go ahead and try to take these switches apart and see what they look like inside. I don't remember off the top of my head exactly how they come apart, so I'm just gonna try to pry them out. Pry them out. There you go, there it is. Unfortunately, I did break this one while I was doing that. But we do see the snap disc. Here's the snap disc. It's just a little metal disc. You know, when it heats up, it'll warp and it'll bounce. In fact, we can um, see that. Look at that. <laughs> That's so cool. And I bet you if I heated this up, it would snap up. Let's try it. Hopefully without burning the camera or my finger. I'm gonna try to make this thing pop up. <laughs> that is so cool. So essentially that's what it does. When it overheats, it pops up and it hits this little switch. Oh, look at that, it snapped back. Hits this little switch and that disrupts the power. If I was to take this lid off, we could see that. But let's see if Let's see if one of these other switches looks a little different inside. Um, I'm gonna use a Nipix for this one. By the way, if you don't have Nipix pliers like this, Nipix Cobra pliers, they are the best angled tooth pliers you can ever get. I used to hate them, but once you get used to them, man, these Nipix are the best. Wow, that is really in there. They must have crimped it in there really hard or maybe even glued it after crimping it. Let's see if I can just rip it off. No, I broke it. All right, there's the snap disc. It's basically the same thing, this little disc. Same thing as this guy over here. And let's see what we can see inside of the switch. I thought I was gonna see a little spring, but it's instead it's a little mechanism like this. Right there, and when it goes down, oh man, this is hard to explain, it's all so small. Basically when the snap disc pops, it pushes down on this, and the two contacts, right here, 
there's two little contacts in here, they separate. This thing goes up. And in order to put it back in, you have to press the button to make them connect again. This is also tiny, it's really hard to explain. I really hope that the next one I take apart, this one, will be able to see that little switch and the contacts better. So I'm gonna try to be a little more careful with this guy so I don't destroy it. I'm gonna try to just like s slowly spin it off. Okay, so unfortunately the shaft flew out and it went who knows where. But basically it was a little rod like this that went in here. There's a little snap disc in here as well. Let's see if I could take this out. Okay. So plastic part, snap disc, little guy like that. So once that snaps, the little shaft that was sitting in here gets pushed in. And when that gets pushed in, this one will hopefully be able to see it. They're all so small. But once this shaft gets pushed in, these contacts, they separate. Hopefully you're seeing that. Right here, these two contacts, the rod pushes in and separates the two. And I'm not applying a lot of pressure either. So that snap disc is enough to force that rod inside of here to split up these contacts. And that interrupts the power and turns the burners off. And since I still have this switch, I'm gonna try to just crush it a little bit. Oh man, I feel like I'm gonna just overdo it. Oh no, that one totally got obliterated. But hopefully by now, here's the little shaft. Hopefully by now you understand how it works inside of there. Um, yeah, that was unfortunate. I probably should have just tried to cut that open instead of crushing it. Sorry guys. Okay, so in summary, if we lined up all the insides, this is what it would look like. You got the outside case, you got the snap disc after it, usually a little plastic part like this, where the little rod sticks into, and then that little rod goes to the contacts right here. And once the snap disc opens, it opens up those contacts and interrupts the power. Well guys, and that is all I had for you. Unfortunately, not everything went as I envisioned it, but still, I think that was good. Hopefully you learned some new things out of this about the limit switch, how it works, and what the insides of it look like. Thank you so much for joining me on this video. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to mash that like button and I'll see you next time. And if you're still here and not in the comment section below, let me share something with you. Today, I gave away my dead batteries. They were free of charge.